Hey folks, thanks for watching my monologues. In case you haven't heard, I'm told there's an election coming up pretty soon. In some areas, there's a lot of violence and civil unrest. If you're in the market for personal protection for yourself or your family, I'd encourage you to visit Guns Etc. Guns Etc. is 10,200 square feet and they have product and they're getting new product all the time. They'll work with you to get the exact type of protection that fits your needs. Stop by their store in Mesa or visit gunsetc.com where you'll have access to over $400 million worth of firearms and accessories. And if you like my monologues, please subscribe to 960 The Patriots YouTube channel. Welcome back and happy October 8th, 2020. I should like to speak on two different matters that continue to bother. The first, the theme from the Democrats, that Donald Trump has ruined our economy. Or, as Joe Biden keeps putting it, Donald Trump has squandered everything he ever inherited. When our economy was humming like a top, Democrats, including Barack Obama, said he inherited their good economy and was benefiting from their policies. Indeed, at the first presidential debate between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, Biden said, quote, we left a booming economy and he caused the recession, close quote. You see, now that the economy has suffered, obviously from massive shutdowns, it's entirely Donald Trump's fault. At a certain point, we have to get off the elementary school playground. Everything good happening since January of 2017 cannot have been the result of the presidency that started then. At the same time, everything bad that happened since 2017 is the result of the presidency that commenced that month and that year. You don't get to shape the narratives that way, or maybe, given the media's lack of inquiry on this, maybe you do. Let us start with a fact that should be shouted out by every Republican running from for office and from the roof rooftops. The unemployment rate today is 7.9%, exactly the same rate it was under President Obama in October of 2012 when he ran for and then won re-election and without a year of shutdowns. But that is not the whole story. Rather, the whole story is that our current unemployment rate is lower than it was for 43 months, 43 months of the Obama presidency, and this in a year of shutdowns that did not exist under Obama and Biden's tenure. And let us not forget, the unemployment rate reached double digits under the Obama-Biden administration Indeed, today's unemployment rate is only three-tenths of a percent higher than it was at this time in 1984 when Ronald Reagan ran on the theme that it was morning in America based on the economy and won 49 states. Perhaps the Carter administration was responsible for being morning in America in 1984 as well. Let's go a little further. As our friends at Issues and Insights point out, GDP growth sharply decelerated in 2016, falling from 3.1% the year before, down 1.7% in 2016, the second worst year under Obama-Biden after the recession ended, and the third year of below 2% GDP growth on their watch. Let's talk about that great economy Obama-Biden gave Trump Pence. Here's the New York Times in October of 2016, quote, For three quarters in a row, the growth rate of the economy has hovered around a mere 1%. In the last quarter of 2015 and the first quarter of 2016, the economy expanded at feeble annual rates of 0.9% and 0.8% respectively. The initial reading for the second quarter of this year, released on Friday, was a dis was a disappointing 1.2%. That's the New York Times. It continued by warning, quote, the underlying reality of low growth will haunt whoever wins the White House, close quote. How did it haunt Donald Trump? It didn't. For their part, CBS reported at the time of the transition, quote, with U.S. economic growth stuck in low gear for several years, it's leading many economists to worry that the country has entered a prolonged period where any expansion will be weaker than it has been in the past, close quote. Sounds a little bit like the Washington Post lamenting in 1979 that the presidency was too big for any one man until Ronald Reagan showed otherwise. 
Reagan showed what energy in the executive could produce, and so did Donald Trump. Rather than steering us into a prolonged period of weaker expansion, Donald Trump slashed taxes and regulations, and we saw a period of growth over 4% and 3.5% unemployment, where there were more jobs available than workers to fill them. There's a lot of short-term amnesia going on here, evidently. When Kamala Harris claims, as she did last night, that the Trump-Pence economy benefited only the wealthy, she simply was not telling the truth. If I may quote from a recent report from the Census Bureau, last year, real median household income reached a record high <coughs> and poverty reached a record low. Medium is middle class. Improvements in income and poverty were the largest in over 50 years. Minority groups, including Black, Hispanic, and Asian Americans, experienced the largest of the gains. Additionally, incomes grew across the distribution and poverty plummeted as a result. The official poverty rate fell to an all-time record low of 10.5% in 2019. Over 4 million people were lifted out of poverty between 2018 and 2019 for a 1.3 percent point decrease. This, again, was the largest reduction in poverty in over 50 years. Just a bit more. The reduction in poverty during the Trump administration was unprecedented. Between 2016 and 2019, 6.6 .6 million people were lifted out of poverty, the largest three-year reduction to start any presidency since the initial drop that began in the war on poverty in 1964. The 1 1.2 million black Americans lifted out of poverty since 2016 is also the largest reduction on record, spanning over 50 years, for the first three years of any president's administration. So note what happens. If you look <clears throat> to that good economic news, if your memory is strong enough to recall 2019 last year, the Democrats will claim it was because of the Obama-Biden presidency, which ended two years before that good economic news and had nothing to do with the economic policies of Donald Trump. If your memory is not strong enough to recall the economic boom of the last few years, the Democrats claim it was all Donald Trump's fault, as is the slump today, which is a slump that still makes the Obama years look bad. And again, Obama didn't have massive shutdowns. Kindergarten playground tactics, or arguments, as I say. But they seem to be absorbed by the media and repeated as if they are credible or true. Maybe I should say adolescent tactics. Why is that? Why adolescent? Well, the other thing I wanted to raise, and it too came out of the debate last night, is the last question from Susan Page. <coughs> She said, quote, I want to close tonight's debate with the question posed by Brecklin Brown. She's an eighth grader at Springville Junior High in Springville, Utah. And here's what she wrote, quote, when I watch the news, all I see is arguing between Democrats and Republicans. When I watch the news, all I see is citizen fighting against citizen. When I watch the news, all I see are two candidate parties trying to tear each other down. If our leaders can't get along, how are the citizens supposed to get along? So for each of you in turn, Susan Page said, I'd like you to take one minute and respond to Brecklin. It immediately reminded me of the final debate in 1980 between Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter. And by acclamation, Jimmy Carter's biggest mistake was saying this, quote, I had a discussion with my daughter Amy the other day before I came here to ask her what the most important issue was. She said she thought it nuclear weaponry and the control of nuclear arms, close quote. There was a groaning by reporters and audience members alike. Invoking a 13-year-old, as Amy was then, on such an important issue was seen as a bad mistake, as bad a mistake and compared to Jerry Ford's four years earlier when he said there's no Soviet domination of Eastern Europe. That's what the media compared it to in 1980. But given our state of adults now assuming adolescent attitudes and thought, I suppose we should expect that question as we did last night, 
coming from the same grade and age that Jimmy Carter tried and failed in trying 40 years ago. So in a more serious time, think about this. What Jimmy Carter did and was universally scored for, scorned for, the media today in a less, less serious time adopts. But hold that for a moment because I think the entire setup of the question is still worth noting. When I watch the news, all I see is arguing between Democrats and Republicans. When I watch the news, all I see is citizen fighting against citizen. When I watch the news, all I see are two candidate parties trying to tear each other down. Yes, when you watch the news, she said it three times. The problem, as Susan Page truly missed it, was that the news was the problem. And it is, because it's the news that doesn't give, report, or engage in journalism anymore. It gives panic, it gives fear, it gives epithet, and it gives analogies to fascism. It does not, as the journalist's creed says, promote accuracy and fairness. It is not, as the journalist's creed says, stoutly independent, unmoved by pride of opinion or greed of power, constructive, tolerant, but never careless, self-controlled, patient, always respectful of its readers, but always unafraid, is quickly indignant and injustice, is unswayed by the appeal of privilege or the clamor of the mob. It is not that anymore. It is rather <coughs> much more like what New Newton Minow once said about entertainment television, a vast wasteland. I'd add a partisan and vast wasteland. You have today a Speaker of the House of Representatives who shredded, physically shredded, the President's State of the Union this year. What was in that State of the Union address? A lot, including a tribute to Tuskegee Airmen and black colleges and universities, and the, quote, lifting of citizens of every race, color, and religion and creed, close quote. You have a Speaker of the House of Representatives who has called Donald Trump's White House one of the most dangerous places in America. You have a Speaker of the House of Representatives who has called the President a racist. <coughs> you have a Speaker of the House of Representatives who has compared law enforcement to Nazi stormtroopers and the White House position on economic conditions, a Nazi-themed Sophie's choice. You have a Speaker of the House who, when asked about rioting and destruction of property, said people will do what people will do, encouraging mob violence. You have a Speaker of the House who has endorsed and endowed candidates who tra traffic and bathe in anti-Semitism. And, wait for it, you have a moderator of the debate last night and Susan Page who is currently writing a book on Nancy Pelosi. Did you know that? It's titled Madam Speaker. She says of it that Nancy Pelosi is, quote, the most consequential speaker in modern times since the legendary Sam Rayburn, close quote. I struggle to find, aside from the history above, what was so consequential about Nancy Pelosi, other than her exacerbating racial, racial tensions and fueling racialist rhetoric. Perhaps if the media were not covering up, ignoring, minimizing, or ignoring this kind of behavior and demagoguery, perhaps if they showed a modicum of outrage over that kind of behavior, including the shredding of the State of the Union, they might just read what's in it <coughs> and know they need not repeatedly ask the president to denounce racism. But that aside, if you're going to take the views of a 13-year-old as serious for political information, I suppose, why not? The world fell all over itself taking instruction from a 16-year-old at the United Nations and here in America last year. <coughs> so maybe a good answer to our 13-year-olds it would be the same answer to our 31-year-olds. Go back to Thomas Jefferson, if you're still allowed to read him. See what he said about how we treat political opponents and dialogue. He said, quote, Every difference of opinion is not a difference of principle. We have called by different names brethren of the same principle. We are all Republicans. We are all Federalists, close quote. Then ask, which party has broken with our principles? and embraced movements that say they are Marxists, openly admit they are Marxist. Ask which party promotes members of the socialist movement in America and happily call themselves socialists. Ask then which party calls the other fascist, tyrant, terrorist, Nazi, and compares the president to Adolf Hitler. 
For once you get beyond a watched news narrative, you will see the quote tearing down of each tearing each tearing of each other down really only comes from one side, a side that doesn't think the other side should exist. We didn't ask for a re-racialization instead of race wars in America. We didn't ask for a delegitimization of the president from day two of his presidency. We just wanted a chance, a fair shot at implementing policies that we thought would keep America great because we believe America is great. Oh, maybe ask too which party says America is not great while you're at it. In the end, and this may very well offend Brecklin Brown, I don't mean it to, we need more adults, not more uninformed and distorted history and analogies, not more childish behavior or thinking. This isn't Brecklin's fault, of course. It's the fault of the likes of Susan Page and her colleagues for nurturing it and fomenting it. For it turns out, in the end, Brecklin's question was more aptly directed to Susan Page than it was Mike Pence or Kamala Harris. She's the one giving an encomium to one of the most divisive leaders of our age. Today, we call such a person a moderator. I'm Seth Leibson. We'll be right back.